introduction to our project. This introduction will include our project backgrounds, our objectives, and our criteria. Then I'll hand it off to my teammates who will each present a section of the proposal. Uh, Everett will talk to you about soil testing. Abby Friedman will talk about soil remediation. And Kurt Kruger will handle the irrigation system. Each section will complete a discussion of the central problem that that section is tackling, the research that was done into that central problem, the solutions that were decided upon, the timeline of the implementation of those solutions, and a conclusion to summarize. Finally, I will present our plan of action, which includes our recommendations and our project plan. So first, I'll give you an introduction into our project. Um, I'll talk to you about our project background, our objective, and our criteria. So our project background is tied into the problems of Detroit today. Um, one major problem is due to a population shift away from the city, which has left a lot of vacant land that isn't being used for anything productive. So a solution that has arisen in uh, recent years and come to a lot of prominence is urban farming, which is exactly what it sounds like. You take a plot of land in the city and use it to grow crops that can help supplement local uh, diets and make local communities more self-sufficient. Um, in order to further this cause, Wayne State University's Department of Urban Studies and Planning and Michigan State University's College of Agriculture and Natural Resources are forming a collab collaboration uh, to create an urban garden in Detroit that can serve as a training ground for agriculture students in urban farming and the site for research for solutions in urban farming. Um, we as engineers are working under the Wayne State Department of Urban Studies and our goal is to take a plot of land that they will select for us and make it suitable for farming. So our overall objective is to prepare a plot of land in Detroit for urban farming of uh, edible produce. Okay, so our criteria break down into the sections of the proposal. Everett section is concerned with uh, determining a plan of action for soil testing. So in order to ensure the quality of life of all people associated with this model urban garden. He wants to protect all levels of the contaminants in the soil that could threaten quality of life of people eating the produce there and working on the land. He also wants to ensure the safety of all workers uh, who are collecting samples and who will be testing those samples. Avi is developing a plan for soil remediation. So his criteria are to maximize the amount of contamination removed from the soil and minimize the toxic waste generated from the process as well as the cost. Kurt wants to implement a system of irrigation in the plot of land chosen. So his criteria are to select a system that is suited to local levels of precipitation and to the water retention of the soil in the plot of land, and also uh, choose a system that is cost-effective and easy to implement for several different types of urban plots. So I just gave you an introduction into our project. I told you the background of our project objective and the criteria that we're following to assess ourselves. Now I'll hand it off to Everett who will tell you about soil testing. describing how long the testing cycle will in fact take, and then I'll go ahead and conclude. So, to understand the problems that are faced with picking a plot of land for urban gardening, it is important to understand that testing is um, the purpose of testing in the first place. Uh, in order to ensure the quality of soil being used for urban gardening, testing is required to detect the levels of contamination present. The figure um, describes many ways contaminants can enter the soil. In residential areas, treated lumber is often used in bathrooms um, in foundation uh, base plates uh, that, and other areas that are in danger of um, coming in contact with water. Uh, if the land was ever used for industrial use, it, will most certainly, it most certainly will contain levels above the accepted 400 parts per million. This is an arbitrary number as of right now, but the research completed, it, it seems that 400 is, is a safe number to, to determine if it's a safe level or not. Um, accidents happen all the time, and this includes chemical spills, which affect
affect the quality of the soil. Although the past land history was residential, industrial, or commercial, different contaminants will be present, which reinforces how important testing actually is. There are many ways that contaminants enter the soil, and the process of the contaminant being present in the soil has, to, has definitely to do with its past land use. These contaminants present will be extracted from the soil from the produce grown if they're not effectively removed, and therefore the quality of life is affected. The research that I've completed on the effects of certain contaminants on human health is, is frightening. Heavy metals are the most harmful and are especially harmful to children if they ingest these, uh, if they ingest the produce that has contaminants in it. Um, they're still developing, so uh, as the chart shows above here, the ill effects of overexposure to heavy metals in our bodies, I will focus mostly on lead in this, in this presentation because it's relatively, it's the most common and it's was used in a lot of other chemicals in the past. Um, negative health effects include impairment of the brain and kidney failure, and the most significant of these being the impairment of the brain in children. It's pretty sad, so you want to make sure everybody's safe. Let us also achieve contributor clinical symptoms such as headaches, muscle fatigue, and um, um, mus mu muscular weakness in both adults and children. So it's not just, just the children being affected, it's, it's also uh, adults. In the recent past, pain gasoline were made with lead, which the research has proved is very harmful with the current testing methods. Um, and with those, they will be caught and, and avoided. Burning waste also contributes to toxicity levels of the soil. When something's burned, it doesn't just go away. Uh, it's a lot of the times the contaminants are carried away with the wind and they're surrounded. Are, or, or deposited in the surrounding soil. Um, so, you know, it, it presents a danger to everybody. So, uh, records. General information of land history will be available from your local public, public records office. Most of this information um, is, is now online because a lot of the records have uh, been uploaded since the web in 1986. Um, however, some of this valuable information is not been uploaded yet, and still a variety of resources can help, including city archives, courthouse records, past terms that would have been pulled in to uh, perform certain modifications to the property. More specifically, the Detroit Public Library has documents that have been donated from the Burton Historical Collection, which would provide any information that current online records or other resources mentioned do not have available. So the sample that we'll be extracting is going to be sent to Michigan State's University's uh, lab for soil and plant nutrition. This is convenient because it's close, it's only like an hour and some change away, an hour and a half, it's, and it's located um, you know, within urban areas. It's not expensive to, be, to do the testing there either, and combined with competent lab technicians that are performing the analysis uh, in the lab that they have available to them, I just think that it's probably the best place to do lab testing anyway. So the strategy to gather the soil um, to be sent to that lab, it's, it's not very complicated at all, but it, it's very important to at least get it right, execute it properly. The first and most important thing is worker safety. So you should wear safety goggles and gloves. Um, certain chemicals tend to concentrate um, within different levels of the soil, but most of the time they concentrate within this first six inches. And this is relevant to our urban garden because um, what we're going to be planting isn't, uh, the, the roots are not going to really grow past six inches anyway. So that's all we'll have to be testing for. Soil samples will be happy to be taken from multiple locations on the property. Um, and the reason for this is because if you just take one one sample, extract one sample, and you, and you take it to the lab, and you get it tested, and analysis comes up, hey, it's contaminant free. It doesn't necessarily mean that the rest of the area is, is contaminant free. Um, so a lot should be kept of all the locations of where the sample was collected from. Um, you should put it into a plastic bag or a plastic container, and it's important for this container to not have been previously used or um, contaminants from its previous use will enter into the soil and it will affect the quality of the uh, testing being done. It might give false results. Um, so, a clean
graphene instruments should be used for the extraction. Other samples coming in contact, like I already said, with one another will provide inaccurate results. And we haven't done any testing yet, but we expect to find that lead contamination in the soil of the plot that we're going to choose, it's going to be present because it's almost impossible to find something that's 100% contaminated. So, like I said, the plot of land that will be chosen as a site for the urban garden will be determined after the testing is completed. It would be a waste of money to try and remediate soil. It's just totally written with contaminants. It's just not favorable. So therefore, the results will decide if the remediation technique is going to be used. Um, the criteria of quality produce will successfully be achieved once the plot has been chosen. So I have a timeline uh, that kind of says the how long the whole cycle takes here. And the first day, just go to the records, see what the land use reuse is. If it's bad, hey, don't use it. If it's all right, um, continue. Day two, gather and deliver the sample to the Michigan State University lab. Days three, four, and five uh, will consist of MSU actually conducting the analysis of the soil itself. On day six, we'll go ahead and retrieve the, the sample and on day seven, if we find that the analysis that we just got done uh, grabbing from Michigan State is, is clean, if the 400 parts per million um, acceptable level is not exceeded, or not excessively exceeded, we'll go ahead and take that site. But if not, go ahead and continue the whole cycle again. So in conclusion, testing is for sure required for urban farming. Harm can come to those that eat produce, and that's definitely not favorable. Contaminants are in inevitable, and precautions should definitely be taken to meet their criteria of preventing harm to the community and improving the overall quality of life. What can be helpful in choosing a plot of land to use for an urban farm is, as I've already mentioned, the land industry. And these records um, should uh, be used to determine if it's worth it to continue to go ahead and test that soil. Uh, the strategy of extraction um, implemented uh, will definitely ensure that worker safety is also um, important and that, uh, that the sample delivered to the MSU uh, lab and the high quality of food produced from the plot will also be met. So to summarize what I have presented to you all tonight, I have given you a central problem. I have told you about the research and how I will use that research solve those problems. The timeline that I have uh, given for the whole testing cycle to take place and to conclude, uh, and I have given you a conclusion. Um, now I'll hand off to my fellow co colleague and presenter, Adi Friedman, who will be speaking to you about soil remediation. Relatively, how much one type of 
machinery are able to remove the contaminated soil, contaminated soil altogether. This is a very uh, effective solution for contaminant removal because it gets rid of the problem altogether instead of just fixing the solution in the soil. We're just removing the soil and replacing it with new uncontaminated soil. The other advantage to excavation is that it's very, it's very, very quick. And it could take in a matter of days or, or a couple weeks to accomplish the removal of the soil and, and replacement some of the disadvantages to excavation are that it's unsure how high the cost will be as a result of using such heavy machinery, as well as um, the soil that's removed. If it is since it's contaminated, so it, it, the contem those contamination, the things in the soil will need to be disposed of somehow. So that's an additional cost to the to the to excavation. Another method of soil remediation.
happy in several years. If, if, if the process takes less than two years, and this is kind of a, a general, we have, this number is not set in stone, two years. However, we, we, we kind of discuss this number of times that two years is kind of an unacceptable um, um, amount of time to wait you know, to give us to complete the remediation process. So we can finish remediation by so a fighter remediation then, and then add compost and continue with the next stage in our, in our, in our project. However, if, uh, if it's more than two years, so then we may just reject the, the, the site because it'll just take too long. The, the levels of contamination are too high. So the appropriate methods, to, just to conclude um, my session and presentation, that the appropriate methods and effective methods now that we've established that soil remediation is necessary, um, our excavation, fiber remediation, uh, possibly, and compost addition. Um, although microbial remediation is an effective method of contaminant removal, for our project, um, it does not, does not fit. So in summary, tonight I spoke about the central problem, why soil remediation is necessary. I spoke about my research and, and solutions um, to essential to artificially provide the water to the crops. Okay, so my goal is to come up with an irrigation system that will uh, satisfy Detroit's unique weather uh, and uh, its own climate and the amount of rainfall it has through each season. It also must be suitable for the size of the plot of our land. Okay, so I began to research a whole variety of irrigation methods. And uh, so like, I'll just highlight some of the ones I came across. Uh, this here is a picture of a center pivot irrigation system. And it's actually designed for large scale commercial farms. Uh, that large pipe sprays water on the ground as it rotates about a center point. But it's just it's way too large for our uh, plot of land. So therefore, it's going to be completely impractical. Um, on a slightly smaller scale, uh, this system right here is called a traveling done irrigation system. And it, this, it's a sprinkler that uh, shoots water out in a radius as it's being pulled across the field. But once again, it's just too large for the type of land that we're going to be irrigating. Okay, and a slightly more feasible type of irrigation system I researched was called a, uh, a permanent set. And this irrigation system is just the it's sprinklers that have pipes mounted in the ground that can provide water to the entire field. However, although it's pl plausible for a Detroit urban plot, I have come across a more, a, a better alternative, therefore I will not be discussing this any further. Okay, I also uh, learned about a method called sub-irrigation. And this irrigation is like taking the crops and growing them in a bin. And at the bottom of this bin exists a water reservoir. And it works really great, and it's very efficient. However, the scale of it is just too small for what we're trying to accomplish. And this leads me to the final type of irrigation that I will be discussing exclusively throughout the rest of this presentation, and that is called drip irrigation. Okay, I first learned about drip irrigation uh, on my tour that I took at uh, Earthworks Detroit Urban Farm. It's a local urban farm right here in Detroit, and um, I simply asked them what type of irrigation system that they used. 
which I'll do with Drift. And the reason why were because it's relatively cost effective, it's very easy to operate, and it does a satisfactory job at irrigating plants. And as those are basically the criteria that I am seeking to accomplish in my irrigation system. Okay, to further describe what drip irrigation is, is it's just it's a long hose that lays across the entire row of crops. And throughout this hose, there are holes punched in it, and water slowly trickles out each one of those holes. Uh, those holes can be placed anywhere between 4 to 24 inches apart. And um, um, this hose must lay next to the entire row of plants. And the reason why is because the water is just very gently trickling out of all the holes. Um, this brings me to why this is a viable solution for our Detroit urban farm. Um, since the water is trickled and not forced out of the holes, uh, that means the, the water can be flowing at a very low water pressure. And this is a good thing because a low water pressure requires a lot less energy to operate than otherwise. And uh, that would save a, a huge cost on pumping the water. Okay, the second, another reason why drip irrigation satisfies the criteria of being cost effective is because it applies the water directly to the roots of the plant. Um, this is good for two reasons. Um, the, the water is only being applied to the roots, which means less water is being used overall, and the dirt in between each of the rows is not being watered. It doesn't need to be, and in fact, that actually discourages weeds from growing. So it's not to say that it completely solves the problem of weeds. However, it's a perk that applies to the drip irrigation methods. Okay, um, now throughout the course of my research, I came upon a concern that uh, had to do with growing plants that start out as seeds. Um, can drip irrigation provide enough water for seeds to grow? Because after all, seeds don't have a very developed root system and can this gentle flow of water be enough for the seeds to grow? And the short answer is yes. But I examined three cases. Uh, two came from farms out in California, and then one was from a farm out in Oregon. And uh, these farmers all concluded that drip irrigation systems can provide enough water for seeds to grow, which means that they will only, they, they can only use that one drip irrigation system. They don't have to purchase any other equipment. Uh, but the catch to that is uh, the drip hose should have 8 inch spaced holes. Um, see, that's as opposed to anything wider. Uh, anything wider than that might not give the correct wetting pattern. And uh, these two figures illustrate what I mean by a wetting pattern. Um, you see, uh, this is an example of a field in which drip hose is buried just beneath the surface. And it's divided into two halves. On uh, the left half has drip hose with 12 inch spaced emitters, and then the right half has drip hose with 8 inch spaced emitters. And um, so this picture on the left shows the field, or the wetting patterns, immediately after the water has been turned on. And then the picture on the right shows the same exact field after 30 hours of water watering. Um, as you can see, um, once a long time has elapsed, the wetting patterns are indistinguishable. But initially, you can see that the 8-inch space holes provided much more even wetting pattern, much quicker, much uh, quicker than the 12-inch space emitters. And that's why I'm going to recommend 8-inch space emitters on our drip hose, because it'll help ensure proper irrigation of seeds when they are very delicate. Uh, drip irrigation further satisfies our ease of maintenance criteria because drip hose can be flushed out uh, after each season at the very minimum or as it's needed in order to prevent blocking. Um, uh, I'm also going to recommend putting the drip hose on the surface of the ground as opposed to being buried uh, because it's just easier that way. And if it's put on the surface of the ground, I recommend orienting the holes upwards. Uh, this is so that if dirt was to go through a hole, it would settle to the bottom of the hose and water would still trickle out. And then lastly, it'll be necessary to remove all of the drip hose from the field over the course of the winter. And it could be stored in a shed or a garage or a basement. And that's actually feasible because the size of Detroit urban farms aren't going to be that big. 
criteria that the drip irrigation satisfies is the ease of operation. It's just, it's very simple, the parts are not complicated, and it's very easy to estimate how much water you need to use. So I feel like it's a very solid solution. Um, I would like to propose this timeline in order to uh, implement this drip irrigation. Um, it's going to take a whole day to measure the length of the field and to calculate the number of rows of crops uh, that will be planted, uh, and then to go to a hardware store and buy all the hose that you need. Now, after that, it'll take, I don't know, roughly a week or so in order to finally lay all the drip hose on the ground. Um, the hose should be laid upon each row being planted. So once the field is entire, however long it takes to plant the entire field is the length of time it will take to implement the drip irrigation. So uh, there are some conclusions I think can draw from my research, and that is that since irrigation is necessary, I found drip irrigation to be the best solution to this problem. And uh, drip irrigation is very well suited for Detroit's uh, climate and the size of the land, and it, it can grow plants from the very beginning of seeds all the way to mature crops, and it's very, very easy to maintain and operate. So I'd just like to summarize my portion of this proposal uh, by uh, reiterating that irrigation is <coughs> relevant to our central problem of the urban environment, and uh, through the research and the solutions I have come up with, I have created a timeline, and I have concluded that the drip irrigation will effectively irrigate a Detroit urban plant. And now I would just like to reintroduce Trisha Fernandez, who will be discussing the, uh, the final step we will be taking as a team. Thank you for the irrigation section, Kurt. Okay, so to wrap it up, I'll be presenting our plan of action. This plan of action consists of our team recommendations and our project time. <coughs> so our recommendations are as follows. Um, as soon as we get the information on the plot of land that is selected by the Department of Urban Studies and Planning, our first step will be to investigate the history of that land in use. From that history, we will be able to determine the probable sources of contamination and the types of contaminants that may be found there. After that assessment is completed, we will begin our testing with Michigan State University's Plant and Soil Nutrient Lab. According to the results from that testing, we will either accept or reject that plot, um, and this cycle can continue. But uh, when we do finally accept a plot of land, we will uh, commence with soil remediation. Soil remediation will consist of an initial excavation of the topsoil, followed by potential phytoremediation, depending on the types of contaminants found and the levels of those contaminants. Finally, soil or compost will be added to the plot to dilute any further contaminants, and this is a process that is continuous and will continue with the uh, seeding of the soil and the agriculture that will take place afterwards. After all of this remediation is complete, a drip irrigation system will be installed. Here is our timeline for each section of the proposal, uh, detailing how long each section will take. Soil testing has been uh, accommodated for uh, one to four weeks. Uh, as Everett presented on his slides, our cycle is about a week long, so one to four weeks gives us up to four cycles in case several plots of land need to be rejected uh, before we find one that is acceptable to uh, begin remediation. Now, soil remediation is the step of the plan that has the most uncertainty as to how long it will take. It can go anywhere from one and a half months to two years, depending on the type of contamination of the plot, and most of this is on how much final remediation will need to uh, take, uh, take into account. Uh, that's why we have so many cycles uh, built into our soil testing phase so that we can have uh, some selection to minimize this time. Uh, but we have set aside two years in case we do need that. If anything goes above two years for the soil remediation, we will reject the plot and try it. After the soil remediation is complete, we will uh, pursue installation of the drip irrigation system. This section of the proposal is only eight days for purchasing equipment and uh, setting up the tools necessary to irrigate. Okay, so to 
summarize our presentation, I first gave you an introduction into our project with our project background, our objectives, and our criteria. I then handed it off to my teammates who presented their sections. Everett talked about soil testing. Avi talked about, about soil remediation, and Kurt went into his irrigation plan. Each section contained a discussion of the central problem tackle, the research done into that central problem, the solutions found, the timeline for those solutions, and the conclusion wrapping up the Finally, I gave you our plan of action with our recommendations and our overall project framework. In conclusion, we believe that our solutions are sufficient to prepare this plot of land for our new collaboration with Michigan State University. Our next steps, if this plan is approved, are to obtain the information and history on the plan that is to be designated by the Department of Urban Studies and Planning. We will then contact Michigan State University's plant and soil nutrient lab um, and begin collecting samples so that they can be delivered to the lab for testing. Thank you for listening to our proposal. We hope that this leaves you with uh, confidence in our solutions and our plan for preparing a plot of land for urban farming and that this plan can be approved. We will now take any questions. question was, does the drip irrigation system continuously uh, supply water to the plants or is it during, only during certain times or seasons? I think Kurt should take this question. Yes, um, actually uh, the drip irrigation can be turned on or off at will. Uh, if you want to use a specific data you can actually set a timer to go automatically. Uh, if you really want to you know, measure the amount of rain and then adjust how much you water according to how much rainfall you have. As long as the water is running, then it's continuous. But you can shut it off once you want. It's, it's very easy to operate. Um, a lot can happen over three years, like financially, vertically, and everything. Uh, how do you determine that the two years is the maximum uh, amount of time that you're going to do? Like, where did that come from? So this question was, why did we cut it off at two years? That is quite a long time and things could change. I think, um, Avi, would you want to cite it? Yeah, actually, um, first was when, when they were working through their, um, when, they, when they were trying to establish themselves as a, as a person that was fancy, um, it was, it was three years to do the excavation and then the excavation and um, the initial council Michigan State University supply to us other than the testing lab. Actually, the lab um, wasn't offered to us. We were the ones who decided that this is probably the best bet. Um, our collaboration is still kind of forming, so we don't really know how much we'll be working with them, but we did choose the lab because they're our collaborators and because they're so close by. Um, I suppose if we really needed resources, it would be either their resources or Wayne State's, but um, other than How big is a 